I'm not going to go through that beautiful introduction of Michael Monti again, but uh, I will say that he has been dealing with a uh, emergency crisis around homeless folks this morning, uh, and I'm thankful that he managed to find the time to join us. So, Michael, take it away. Uh, thank you, Senator, and I appreciate the introduction. And um, I, I do feel that I can bring in a range of different sort of perspectives to the, the development of housing in, in, um, in Vermont. And, I want to express my deep appreciation for the continuing critical support for affordable housing that you all have provided uh, individually and as a committee and as from the state of Vermont. We are sometimes the envy uh, of others around the country. You have done a great job. Um, last night, the state supported COVID isolation quarantine facility uh, that we run in a former motel, which we purchased with funds from you, was full um, for the first time. Uh, during this meeting, I've been negotiating additional capacity motel to manage sort of the rise in COVID. Uh, daily and at the community level, uh, we witness enormous needs and enormous responses from our staff, but also from the community as a whole. Uh, please, as you develop policy at this fairly heady level uh, and at this very high level, know uh, that what uh, that what you do matters in our communities and our neighborhoods. So I just want to express my appreciation to and let you know uh, that this work continues um, at this level, but it continues really uh, at the level of the street and on the sidewalks in our neighborhoods and communities. Uh, I'd like to touch on several points. First, uh, we, we believe that you heard Eric Farrell that the private sector has a role in addressing affordable housing. We work regularly with largest developers, contractors, and industry professionals in advancing the construction of housing of all incomes. We initiated, and I think all the senators from Chittenden County signed on to the Building Homes Together campaign in Chittenden County. Hundreds of privates and public officials have signed on to this campaign. Thank you. Our goal is to construct 5,000 new homes and apartments in the next five years, of which 25%, 1,200 12, plus will be affordable. I know that we have lined up the opportunity to do so. Uh, we are poised to be able to build 900 new homes over the next few years. 200 of those will be home ownership. We do this in anticipation of additional resources, both at the state and the federal level. Uh, the state support for our work has been enormous, and we urge continued support to BHC, for BHCB, uh, for the programs that VHFA has, uh, is operating, uh, for the fo folks at the VCTB level as well, um, and some of the new initiatives and ideas that are out there. We'd like to continue to have those conversations. We believe that there's opportunities to do more. Um, as real estate developers ourselves, we fully understand the economic challenges facing builders trying to to bring house to mark the fact that developments costs exceed appraised values, prevents modestly priced homes from being built and forces builders to construct higher end housing, further stratifying the market. Allocating funding for the difference between the appraisal and the sale price and the development cost makes good policy sense. Uh, um, Eric was talking about 18%, that's not unusual. Right now in this crisis, that would be a great response from the state to support that work. Uh, to get the pricing, the cost of development down to a place where it meets the appraisal price, just that alone would it be an enormous uh, level of support. We urge you to consider supporting that program. Uh, we also have supported on a national level, have done so for several years, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, NHIA, which is in the Build Back Better Act, which we know has not yet been passed, but nevertheless, the point of the program uh, is important. It would provide about a third of the development costs of a modestly priced home. Um, and um, similar to what a 4% tax credit does now for low income housing, uh, for multifamily rental properties. And in doing so, really bring the price down fairly dramatically so that moderately in, uh, uh, moder moderate income individuals can afford home. We are mirroring that program right now in Winooski. You have 20 condominiums being constructed Right now, we're going to marketing in the next few, day, uh, few days. We've been doing a lot of pre-development, but 20 condominiums, uh, mostly three bedrooms, most with two baths for large families, uh, mostly trying to market to the Winooski uh, uh, population. That program, the New Market Tax Credit Program, will provide us with a third of the cost of the development of that housing and with support from VHFA and VHCB through, through state tax credits and through the VHCB program. We're going to be able to price um, three bedroom 
two baths homes for 1,300 square feet from $150,000 to $165,000, which is an enormous value. When you really look at that, you actually are able to provide home ownership to people at lower than the market rents currently in Chittenden County. But we must stress the importance overall of permanent affordability as a policy in all how in, 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 our, in our programs, but including uh, home ownership. Um, I think the committee has gotten a piece. How does the shared equity home ownership program deliver? I, hopefully, you get a chance to look at that. We've spent some time thinking through the various issues that people have talked about when they talk about shared equity and how it works. Um, we have been really a leader in the shared equity program now for, for a few decades. The real innovation of the program is that in exchange for the public support, our buyers agree to preserve affordability forever by sharing a portion of the home's appreciation at resale. Think of it as paying, forward, paying it forward. Think of it as preserving the public's investment. Imagine if all the tax credit projects that we built over the last 30 years suddenly came up and were no longer affordable after 10 or 15 years. It would be an enormous devastation to the rental market that we have. By preserving home ownership in this way, the way we do it, we provide affordability, stability, legacy, and in fact, build wealth for individuals. Uh, with this program, right now we have 636 homes have been made affordable now. Uh, we have supported over 1,200 new homeowners. Here's some of the highlights. I want to do this as quickly as I can, knowing how much time I have. Um, Actually, we just got a little bit more time because Nancy Owens had to leave. So take your time. Well, I hope maybe she could send me her testimony and I could do it for her, help her out with her. <laughs> well, hope, hopefully she sent it to us. Okay, <laughs> I hope so too. Um, <laughs> So, um, so let me say, shared equity homeowner helps renters become homeowners and delivers more economic security. security. We, uh, with CHT providing the down payment and lowering the monthly housing costs, many, um, many more renters were able to purchase a home. As a matter of fact, owning a CHT home is less expensive than renting the same home at the current market rent in Chittenden County. The average monthly housing cost of a two-bedroom shared equity home over the past two years was less than $1,200. The fair market rent for two bedroom home is over $1,600. And their housing costs are more stable with fixed mortgage payments and the ability to pay down mortgages and build equity and wealth. Our modern income owners can become homeowners and accumulate wealth with little upfront investment. From 2016 to 2020, about 150 shared equity homeowners sold their home and went on to become homeowners in the private market with an average proceed sales of almost $40,000. So they're able to take that and then go ahead and, and, and get into the private market. Um, in the, um, it, offers, it offers mobility. The program acts as a type of stepping stone to traditional home ownership. About 70% of our shared equity owners buying on our, buy on the open market when they sell. Others sometimes fail, go back to renters. Others are doing other things, but for the most part, many are becoming regular homeowners in the private market because they can afford it. Um, it creates a legacy for their children, creates a legacy for the family. You know, we, when you become a shared equity homeowner, we don't check your income every year. If you make more money, God bless you. Go on and save that money on the lower cost that we have and buy a home. That's what's really happening when we, people do become homeowners, they're able to sort of increase their pay, increase their income and be able to sort of uh, buy something else uh, within the market. Uh, so family members can stay. We have have members who are uh, homeowners who have been homeowners forever, uh, literally decades. Our average sale happens within seven years. Typically in the homeownership market, it's six years. So people stay a little longer, but for the most part, they are typical homeowners. Um, and locking the affordability uh, and it's, it's the, really the most efficient use of public resources. It has the initial investment to build a permanent stock of affordable homes that can serve multiple generations of buyers. Um, let me just say this, we sold 44 homes in the past year of which 35 homes were homes that didn't need any additional public investment. They were resales. Uh, we were only built 10 more. Once, if we we're able to build 20 or 30 or 50 more homes a year, the stock of permanently affordable homes will be there year after year 
and that would be a great resource for a moderate income people. And I think Gus showed you the slide of the type of homeowner we have. They're working home, they're working people. Nobody is, very few folks are becoming homeowners now who are not working or are able to show at least some level of, uh, of, of uh, capacity to be able to own a home. Um, a study of CFC's program demonstrated it helps over five times more households buy a house than traditional homeowners or programs where the money is simply given to the, to the homeowner. It, it demonstrated that 357 households attain homeownership requiring just $2.2 million worth of investment as opposed to the $10.6 million which would be necessary. This is fairly complex numbers and not pretty straightforward. I can provide you with the study to show how that initial public investment um, um, uh, stays uh, and provides benefits for years to come. Um, that's all I'm going to say about shared equity. There's more I can say. There's certainly more details in terms of the program. I'd be glad to do that, and I'll stop on that. I did provide you with that report. I do want to say a couple of other things very quickly. Um, we are working with the Working Bridges uh, program here in Northwest Vermont, the United Way. That pro they provide support to human resources departments uh, in the area's largest employers. Um, we're looking towards working on a solution to an employer-based housing which we believe will work. Um, we've had some initial discussions with them. We have some initial discussions with some employers about the, their needs and how we could structure something. And we've been actively trying to build something that will work uh, for uh, them. Um, I can go into the details of our thinking about that. Uh, but in closing, I just want to say, once again, appreciate your support uh, to addressing housing needs of Vermonters. CFC is a multifaceted in the, uh, program. We do multifamily rental. We do work in the homeless arena. We also do home ownership, and I wanted to focus on the home ownership uh, for you today. But thank you for the time. Uh, so I just want to say briefly, I'm a big fan of shared equity housing. Um, I still have in my garage someplace, and I'll get it to you, Michael, the original BCLT lease that I developed with Roger Cohn uh, that in part started a lot of this stuff. Great, uh, Chris, but, thank you very much, Senator. But I, but I wanna know what's stopping you from doing more? Of well, again, it's resources. Um, it's, it's nothing fan, fancier than, than how we think about this. If, if we had, the, for instance, the NIJI program and really focusing on the shared equity program, that provides about a third of the construction costs, right? Uh, of the development of, a, again, a moderately priced home, nothing fancy, moderately priced home. Um, and in doing that, we really are really one leg above. If uh, BHCB has a program for home ownership, we are able to access that and also able to access state tax credits. Uh, and then the homeowners are coming in with a third of the cost of that development with the mortgage, with their mortgages, basically. We're able to put together something. And that's what we did in Winooski. Essentially, Winooski really mirrors that NHIA type program. But again, it's a it's a, a decent amount of resource. If we had that, now the low income housing tax credit program has been around for decades. It has produ produced thousands of units of so four or 5,000 units in the state of Vermont, right? If we had something similar to that decades ago, we would have home ownership like crazy, opportunities like crazy. It would just be, it would be, it would be that, it would be relatively that easy. Um, and, um, and I say that it's that easy knowing that it's hard uh, to do these things. Um, but and, and that's, the, that's the missing piece. We simply don't have that sort of public subsidy at that third of, a, at that third of the pricing of the homes. Um, we, it is not, you can't use new market tax credit for housing. Um, we're able to do it because we have established a business to build affordable home ownership. And that's how we're doing it. So it is not a, new, a not a very easy thing to do to use new markets. You can't just do it everywhere. But the NIJA building is attempting to do that is right, really creating that opportunity to provide that resource uh, for the tax credit to make it work. Is there any, um, I know in the early years, there was concern that there may be resentment or this is not the American way to, to give out this subsidy to take it back at the resale of the home. I'm definitely a big fan of putting guidelines and guardrails and strings on whatever we give money to 
folks, whether it's business or individuals, to have good policy built in and attached to that loan or grant. Do you find in any of your share equity thing that people in any way wake up 15 years later and say, what? You know, I, you yeah. know, this is not appropriate. I, I should get the benefit of all this appreciation. It happens. It's very rare. It's, it's, I don't think it's, un, it's nevertheless not, not unusual for anybody to wake up 15 years later and say, what, what did I do around any kind of economic uh, thing they might've been involved in? I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, our, I can tell you that in the conversations we have with homeowners, they're almost, almost always grateful. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we simply, we don't simply say, here you go, sign this paper and walk away and grab this, grab the stuff. We sit there, we, we provide counseling, we provide support, we provide education. We sit down with documents. You know this, they sign, they sign, they sign not only all the legal documents, but we ask them to sign a document that says, you know what you just did when you signed this, you made sure that we're going to give you a big chunk of money. And in exchange, when you go and sell, you're going to keep a chunk of the appreciation and the mortgage payments and the improvements you made to your house. But we're going to take that two, that 75% of it and we're going to pay it forward to the next family who needs that home. You take that appreciation, go buy a home, take care of what you need to take care of, with the, do whatever you want to do with that money, retire into a, some kind of retirement home or something like that. But but that's what that's what we do, and we do it up front. Um, people are, for the most part, grateful. And the other part of what we have is that all of those homeowners have us to call to continue support. We have a, as a program, and this is true of all the homeownership centers around Vermont. Once you become a, uh, once you become a, when, once you become a client, once you become a, you know some a customer, you're always a customer. And then Keisha, if you want to give us a call, you can. I think you came into one of our programs once. And so call us if you need help. But I'm just saying that's that's the status of uh, of anybody who's come to the program. So we will backstop home uh, homeowners. Uh, homeowners don't lose their homes. They don't go away with no with broken credit. Um, they're in the crash. We didn't have any of that because we were working through people and working through their their stuff and giving, making sure that, that we can give them the support they needed. That's simply part of the program that we have. And so that backstopping is really important. We very seldom, uh, Senator, it's a good question. Do we get people regretting it? Uh, and I think as we talk to people, we show in fact that people build, do build wealth. So can that's you, what. Thank you. That's great to know. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the opportunity to convert commercial space to residential space in this environment right now? Uh, Senator, do you want to, Senator Clarkson, want to speak about shared equity quickly? Um, sorry. I'm just, I'm sorry. Did you want to ask a question? I, 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 I'm sorry, you're right. Senator Clarkson. No, I, I just wanted to ask you a question, Michael. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, shared equity, e either way, uh, it, it's, um, you touched on something that we're exploring in, in, in different ways. Which is partnering with businesses and nonprofits who who desperately need housing for their workforce. Hospitals. I mean, in our area, Mount Oscotney, with um, the former Windsor Prison, is a great example. That would be a, I think, a terrific redevelopment of that site. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. You touched on this just lightly, but are you working actively with any? Empl big employers or a group of employers that would be interested in being partners, investing in housing, uh, that yes. would because I think that's an additional piece that we are going to be need to engage. Yes, I think we are. I mean, I, I would say that we are um, through Working Bridges. Um, that program represents a, a dozen or so employers. We have met with the HR people. We've met with a handful of the owners. We've had discussions with other owners who have said, we're prepared to provide you with some, some amount of money uh, in, in exchange. You can provide housing at a lower cost. Now, it gets more detailed than that because we want to be careful about uh, the employee being part of the employer system. If they're no longer part of the employer system, so we have some stuff to work through. But we think there's some ways of doing that that, in fact, get to at least on a, not a long-term basis, but on a short-term basis, really supporting the employees as they need, you know, get housed. We have employers, we have employers in Chittenden County right now who have employees who are sleeping in cars, right? You know, well, so the, state, 
the state has those. Yeah, I we mean, need we need to do better than that, right? So uh, um, we think there's some ways of us to do that on a more not on a sort of a permanent basis, but a short term basis to get people out of their cars into something that's affordable while they go ahead and they're able to uh, find themselves in permanent affordable rental housing uh, or home ownership. Um, It'll require, I think, um, support from you all for some amount of equity, but we think we can do that with investments from employers. I'm being optimistic because that's what developers do. Uh, Eric Farrell knows that. Uh, we're pretty optimistic about the opportunities we see in front of us, but we've had good conversations about that. And, and Senator Sorokin, around your conversation about vacant spaces, I think some are good, some don't work. We're do doing that right now. We're Converting three dorms over in St. Mike's, you, you've uh, we've been got we've had support for tax credits and from BACB on that in particular. That's a great opportunity. That's 64 units that we're going to start construction hopefully soon. You know we have bought now our eighth motel hotel um, that was done last month, and so we're working on sort of the conversion of the spaces that are either left behind or on those in particular. Um, some some spaces are better than others. You know, there's a the, the memorial auditorium in the middle of downtown Burlington. I don't know how it be, could be good for housing. It'd just be really a struggle to do it, you know. Uh, but if there is something, uh, but I do see the opportunity. Shopping centers are um, are a little, a little trickier. You'd have to sort of figure out a way to get to, it's really about code um, uh, and windows uh, and sort of that kind of, uh, those issues principally. Those so the size, size of the building has to be correct or, or right to make, or make it work. Yeah. Well, those are the kinds of things that if we can provide through legislation or something to make the conversion uh, make sense, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just reaching out for some creative thinking. Um, you know, we know that remote work is going to be more prevalent in the future, regardless of what the trajectory of COVID is. And if that's the case, some office space, I mean, we're not New York, we don't have big office buildings, but we do have some buildings that have office space that I think is gonna be less in demand. And, you know, we talk about, um, converting motels or dorms and things like that. I mean, I just think of like the Capitol Plaza in Montpelier. You know, you have commercial space right next to a hotel room on some floors. Um, is there anything we can do to start seeing more of that different kinds of thinking and different kind of use and encourage that? Because I think obviously, well, not obviously, but in some instances, renovation as opposed to new construction. Yeah. It, can be uh, a way to get more housing. That's why I'm such a big fan of ADUs. Um, you know, we saw on our tour, we went to Rutland and we saw all these big houses. That was when people used to live in large family that can be converted into rental units. But it seems like just as our population ages and people leave the workforce, people are staying in their homes. If you can make it real easy for them to put an accessory dwelling unit, they say, why don't I get some more income? Yeah. And it's going to be cheaper to develop a unit there than to build new construction. I, I think one of the federal sources right now can actually support the, the construction of ADUs. I'm not exactly sure of that. I think it's the, um, the rental assistance program uh, can do more with ADUs. And we haven't really uh, looked at that or tapped that out quite yet to sort of see how that would really work. Um, you know, our, our, our efforts have been focused on the motels because it's, um, there's a bathroom in every, every room and there's a usually, you know, there's a door in every room and there's heating and electrical in every room and it's really much more straightforward and the configuration allows for life safety issues to be, you know, installed or used very, fairly straightforwardly. Uh, and some of them are built really um, to a standard that is very high and the opportunity conversion is there. So our cost of development is really a third less than a new construction. Yeah, and I'm not, real, and I'm not really necessarily talking about CHT yeah, specifically. Yeah. I'm thinking of a plan for average Vermonters to do it themselves. And I was very excited a couple of years ago, they had some guy, I can't remember his name from 
Montpelier, who was an expert at ADUs, and he was providing, I don't know whether it's free technical assistance, but if someone could say to me, for instance, I'm living here with two people in a 2,400 square house, and they can make it real easy for me, both technically and permit wise, and say to turn, you know, one quarter of my house into a separate unit. Uh, I think a lot of people might consider that. Yep. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you so much, Michael. I hope you'll be available to us as a resource. Always. Go forward. Our last, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last, this is thank you. Michael Redmond. Uh, is Michael with us? I'm looking. There he is. Hi, Michael. I recognize the face. Yeah, great. Thanks, yeah, Senator. I need to, I'll need to uh, leave in about five minutes because uh, I have to okay. host a, uh, a, a webinar, a Zoom uh, session myself. Um, and uh, this is you know, a little bit outside our area as a service provider, but we, uh, I think to emphasize the strong partnerships that, that uh, work uh, for us, that start you know, thanking you and, and your colleagues in the, in, in the legislature for its work to make Vermont uh, unsurpassed in, in focus on these efforts. Uh, the agencies, VHCB, VHSA, uh, VHFA, uh, Commerce and Community Development, I mean, again, uh, high quality focused work, really uh, smart. Our work in partnership also with our local housing developer, Twin Pines Housing, is one that I think works extremely well. And I know there are other uh, similar in, or, organizations on the state which partner up service providers that focus on homelessness and those unhoused um, with uh, those are our housing uh, development. And uh, so we can comment on some of the things that we've seen that have worked in that arena. Perhaps they touch on your concerns today, but certainly they are on the support side of that work. Things that we've had success with and, and um, motel conversions that have been mentioned, uh, we're hopeful to continue uh, that uh, type of work down in uh, the Upper Valley uh, region. Uh, manufactured homes, a uh, really underutilized resource. We've uh, partnered with a whistle stop uh, site in Bradford uh, with Downstreet Housing with uh, permanent um, uh, project-based vouchers and allowed three of our families to move from status of emergency shelter into uh, now their, their own uh, rental uh, units um, uh, with, uh, with the Haven providing uh, services that was mentioned earlier by uh, someone who provided testimony that sometimes that isn't in place. The partnership that we have with Twin Pines is that we stay, we have multiple MOUs with them where we can provide services. It is uh, sometimes a challenge on the funding side. So we would encourage the extended use of voucher support that also provides service support. Um, the Medicaid state plan now is uh, under is up for renewal uh, with the feds and there are increased opportunities for supportive housing in that. And we would encourage you and joining your colleagues as, as, that, uh, as that comes before uh, the appropriate committees to uh, focus on that family supportive housing expansion has been tremendous. We should continue that as well as to focus on individual uh, housing, uh, supportive housing so that uh, that um, is a uh, eligible uh, activity under the Medicaid uh, state plan. Um, location is really important. We've heard that a focus on, on downtown areas, and we agree with that. Uh, access to services and transportation due to the rural nature of our state, the degree that we have uh, opportunities that, uh, for housing that focus on those areas where, particularly for people who have been chronically homeless, to continue that support and services that are going to help them become productive members of, of the community. Uh, I've heard mention you, yourself, Senator, on ADUs and infill, um, and also answering a question that uh, Senator Clarkson mentioned of how many units are there? Well, you know, the regional planning associations uh, are great resources for that kind of focus and setting those numbers. And here in the Upper Valley, which includes both the New Hampshire side and um, the Vermont side, four to 5,000 units of housing of all forms are needed with larger numbers at the um, uh, lower levels. Their, pro, their uh, report, Keys to the Valley, is uh, we have found has been ex extremely helpful. And uh, I think for working with the towns and municipalities that maybe want to be helpful, but maybe don't know how of focusing on the rules and regulations that they might have in place that are hindering the development of housing 
and the rehabilitation that the state has taken on in some areas where there is bringing it up to code. So echoing um, uh, also comments earlier that Mora made of, of focusing on the rental housing and safety legislation that will be coming back into um, uh, the, the consideration by the legislature this year. Risk pools, uh, we've had a mixed success uh, experience with that, but I think it's still worthy. The challenge now is that landlords have their pick and choice of who they wanna have in, in housing. And so the, 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 um, even when we've offered risk, they said, well, I could rather, I can do just as easy without, with a tenant that doesn't present uh, a history of problems. Um, um, the uh, continued work on the GA emergency housing, we are concerned now as we look into this, you know, that the, the state's support for that has been tremendous, but it's going to be ending. And how are we gonna replace that? I think the focus on designing a really well-structured, well-funded program of if the, the goal is to move that to community organization contracts to make sure that's done right. And I think the Haven is ready to, uh, to step up and uh, take that on if we can design that with our good partners at OEO, if uh, that comes about. Sorry for speaking so quickly, but I need to run to go uh, to host a Zoom uh, seminar where my, my predecessor, uh, Sarah Kobolenski will be speaking uh, and the 40th anniversary uh, series of uh, events that the Haven is holding. And this is our last one. And I don't want to keep Sarah waiting because uh, she always has something good to say. Uh, Give her our best. Absolutely, Senator. I will certainly send your, your best wishes because Thank I you. only bask in uh, everything she's created here. Now you Thank are you. A, a great steward to her legacy too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And okay. uh, I'm interested in learning more about the Medicaid possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be happy to yeah. come back at another time when we have more time to talk about that. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thank Michael. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Senator Rahm, did you have a question for that witness that is now gone? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I didn't, but I was, I was looking for an opening earlier before we end. Um, yes. Just to say, you know, I think one of the programs it would be nice to hear from um, would be Home Share Vermont. I know that might sound like a tangent, but when I visited, especially places in Southern Vermont where they're trying to help seniors and attract new Americans and house immigrants and refugees. When I was in Bennington County, many even of our colleagues in the house had never heard of Home Share Vermont. The penetration in Southern Vermont is just really limited. And I know they opened another office, so I'm not blaming them, but I, I think there should be like a PSA or some way to get them resources. I think it would be a win-win for seniors and a lot of people looking for homes and the ability to really maintain some large historic houses that are otherwise kind of falling into disrepair. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it, it's, it was basically a Chittenden County program for a while. Then they moved, I think they opened an office in, Mo in central Vermont, but you're right. It's not really uh, penetrated in other areas of the state. And it's a great opportunity. I don't know, is Kirby Dunn still running the program? And yeah, she's great. So um, it's, a, it's a great program. And we're only just beginning to roll it out here in Woodstock uh, through the senior center. And it's, I agree with you, Keisha. It's um, it, it, it again, hits a lot of birds with one stuff. It, it really meets lots of our needs if we can make it work uh, statewide more effectively. Um, so it's been a long morning. It's 11. 56. There's a couple of witnesses we didn't get to, and I'm sure we'll have others in terms of overview, but uh, the future hearings will start becoming more interactive with committee members. Uh, just wanted to get uh, a broader view of the landscape out there and what I've asked David to do as these ideas come in, and I've gotten a few emails already. I've given them to David and He's going to start putting together an omnibus bill with various sections, and it'll just be something we can work off of uh, without, you know, prejudging any ideas too quickly. But I think we have a host of people that not only did we get to meet today, if we hadn't met them before, but hopefully they will continue to be available to us to come in and certainly listen into our hearings as we go forward. You, uh, as I said before, I'd like to do this as a committee bill. Theoretically, committee bills have to be introduced by January 31st, but you can always bring it. Well, I don't know what the rule is if you bring it back in 
to committee, but we have a raft of other bills that'll be sitting in our committee that we could just do strike alls and put on uh, this omnibus bill. But so far I've been encouraged by people responding to the idea of an omnibus bill. And you know, you can see all the various ways you can go, service, home sharing, ADUs, land use planning, more money for new ideas and continued ideas, tweaking ideas. Um, but I think the goal is clear, more housing. So, more housing. And yeah. I, you know, the, the number I remember from the Vermont Futures Project is 10,000. So I, I, that is the number. And that's why I asked Gus if we had a sort of newer number on the workforce number, because I, it's just so many units. And while it's fabulous that we have built as much as we have in the last two and a half, three years, <laughs> the need is, is daunting. As we all know, because we all know business, you know, we just, it's very clear. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear from all our witnesses and housing leaders. I, I did hear the comment that we're the envy of the rest of the country. So maybe there aren't that many other creative ideas around the nation, but the people we had before us today would probably be the ones that would know about what's going on in other states and jurisdictions that we might be able to borrow from. So uh, looking forward to talking about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all, for, Senator. Thank you all for participating. Witnesses, thank you. And members of the public, thank you for viewing. Thank we'll you, Michael. We'll see you on the floor. And we'll be taking this up again next week sometime.